So this morning, the title is, It's Coffee Time. I trust you all had a cup of coffee this morning, but uh, the book of Hebrews, he brews. Ah, you get where the coffee time comes from, eh? It's time to study the book of Hebrews, eh? He brews. And I tell you now that God brews the best cup of coffee. He, it's, a, it's a dish that he serves to you and I. It's fresh and it's new and it's vibrant every single day. And so you and I can enjoy the way of life, the kingdom culture series, have a cup of coffee with God in the morning. And what does that look like? It looks like you and I are sitting down and opening the word and just being with him, spend time with him. So Jeannie and I will often sit uh, first thing in the morning, we have a coffee together, and it's usually around conversation. And so we'll grab a coffee and we'll sit in the lounge and we'll just talk about what is God saying to her? What is God saying to me? What do we feel for the church? What do we feel for specific people? What do we feel about our day? What do we feel about our kids, our life? We just talk in general and it's usually around a cup of coffee. And so I want to encourage you this morning that your cup of coffee early in the morning should be this. So I want to encourage you to take time to sit somewhere with your cup of coffee, he brews, and just inquire of God. One of the best places for you and I to start is in Psalm 139. And I think as you read Psalm 139 and you spend time, this means possibly putting your cell phone off, finding that time. In English, we'll often use a phrase, we chisel out the time to be with God. And so sometimes in our day, there can be so much busyness that we have that we need to chisel out some time to be with God. Put it in your diary. If you need to put a reminder on your phone, the 12 o'clock every day, you're going to have a cup of coffee with the Father and spend some time with Him. So I want to encourage you this morning in the way of life, in our kingdom culture series, is to spend time with the Father and have a conversation with Him. So prayer is dialogue, which means two-way conversation. We understand it. We've said it many times before. Prayer is not me just babbling for two hours and then walking out the room saying, I've prayed today, that's it, I'm done. We haven't given God time to speak to us. And so prayer is like a conversation. We are going to sit down somewhere quiet, get rid of all the distractions, and just converse with my Father. And when we converse with Him, it's not, hey Lord, how are you doing? Because He's always good. Yeah? But conversing with God is just, I love the, the acronym for pray. Is it acronym? I think it is. Yeah? P-R-A-Y. So when we come into His presence in the morning and we spend time with Him, pause in His presence. That just means clear your head, clear your heart, pause in His presence. And often pausing in His presence, a revelation of His goodness and His kindness floods your heart. But pause, and even if it is a 10-minute pause, don't say anything. Just soak up, close your eyes, and soak up His goodness. Soak up His love. Pause in His presence. Then the R stands for rejoice. We enter His courts with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we enter his courts with praise. And so the R in pray is rejoice. And we rejoice like we did this morning with song. So put YouTube music on if you want to. Otherwise, just rejoice in his goodness. Just rejoice in who he is as a father to you and I. Just rejoice in what he is doing in our city and in our region. Just rejoice for those that are saved, for the new people that he's calling in. We just rejoice in who he is and in what he does. The A is to ask. Now remember, I've said it before, and I'm going to remind you again, we do not ask God for what we want and what we need. Because Matthew 6 says, I know what you need. Seek my righteousness and my kingdom. So when I ask God for stuff, I'm asking him for a fresh revelation of his kindness. I'm asking him for a fresh revelation of his word, that when I open the word, excuse me, 
that when I open the Word of God, it starts to become real to me, and I get a fresh revelation. You know, I don't know about you, but I can read a scripture 10 times or over 20 years, and that scripture will just about mean something different every single time I read it. So the Bible tells us that the Word of God is fresh and new every day. And so when I ask, I ask Him for the harvest. Exactly what Alreen was saying about how, how important life groups are. We ask Him for the harvest. Jesus said, the harvesters are few. Therefore, ask the Father of the harvest to send out workers. So when you're spending your quiet time with the Lord or, or some time aside with Him, you're asking Him for your, for your neighbors who don't yet know the Lord. Father, that they would be saved. You know, Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, hovered over creation. So that God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit were present at the time of creation. And the Holy Spirit hasn't stopped hovering over you and I. When I, I did a trip to Swaziland a few years ago, uh, I used to do quite a few trips to Swaziland, but on one occasion, we went to this church up in the mountains, close towards Pig's Peak. Uh, I think there's a casino up there. But anyway, one of the, the villages, and it had a, a rough wooden sort of pallet walled with, with corrugated iron roofs. And the, the guy leading it, his name was Nimrod, but he had a funny eye, so his eye was like this. And I remember praise and worship in Swaziland is four hours. Eh? And then preaching is another four hours. So it's like a whole day. Eh? So on Nimrod, towards the end of praise and worship, he's got his eye like this. He's got the microphone and he says, I can feel the Spirit hoovering in this place. <laughs> so he wasn't hovering, the Holy Spirit was hoovering. Can you imagine like, you know, vacuum cleaner sucking up everything? Eh? So we pray by pausing in His presence. Rejoice in his goodness. Or, A, we ask him for the nations. We ask him for our, our family members who don't yet know the Lord. Those who don't yet understand the work of Holy Spirit, I ask the Father to reveal the work of Holy Spirit in people's lives. Because, friends, can I be honest with you? If we function or live or relate to the Father without acknowledging Holy Spirit, it's religion. It's dead. It's worthless. We need to understand that an embracing of Holy Spirit is absolutely critical for you and my fresh revelation and for us to be able to walk in the power of His Holy Spirit. So it's critical that we acknowledge the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then why, in the word pray, is yield. I just yield to Him. And often in a place of yielding, in a place of surrender, is often when he speaks. So I've paused in his presence, I've rejoiced at his goodness, I've asked him for those who are not yet saved, that Holy Spirit would work in their hearts, and I yield in his presence. So it's a beautiful picture of what it is, looks like for you and I to pray. It's certainly different to getting into our presence and saying, God, I need a new car. I need this person to stop fighting with me. I need money in the bank. I need this, I need this, I need this. And I don't know about you, but I was, I was, I grew up, brought up, learning that's how you pray. And that's actually not how we pray. So I want to change the way I pray by simply pausing in His presence, rejoicing at His goodness, asking Him for the nations, asking Him for people to be saved, and then yielding in His presence. I'm not saying it's wrong to say, Father, I need X, and He knows what we need. So instead of we're asking Him for our physical needs, we speak those physical needs, like we did this morning about healing. We say, thank you for healing God. Not once in the Scriptures does Jesus ever ask his father to heal anybody? He just spoke healing. Your faith has healed you. Be healed. Walk in your freedom. And so he spoke healing over every single person. Not once did he ask. If you and I start asking the father to heal somebody, it can mean then that sometimes he doesn't want to heal people. And we don't see him that way. We see him as a good, good father who wants everybody saved 
and everybody healed. And so we don't ask him for healing. We speak healing over our situations. You can speak healing over your finances. And speaking healing over your finances doesn't mean you're going to get more finances. It just means that you're going to deal with finances differently. So when you speak healing over your finances, it is to say, Father, restore my mind so that I can know how to handle money well. So that's how we pray and how we release His goodness over us. Is that good? So the Bible says clearly, seek first my kingdom and righteousness and all these things that we often worry about that keeps us awake at night will be added to you as well. So we clearly don't dwell on all these things because the Bible tells me in Matthew 6 that the Father knows what I need. I have to trust that. I have to take him at his word. If he says he knows what I need, I've got to trust him that he does. And so I don't concentrate on these things. I concentrate on his goodness and his righteousness and his, and his, and his love for you and I. Does that sound good? So, puzzle pieces. As we talk about the kingdom, just maybe the puzzle starts to take a bit of place in your life and you start to see. Maybe you start a puzzle with the outer border. I don't know how you guys would do it. Maybe you do that, start with the outer border and you slowly work your way in. Maybe what you do is you start in the middle and you start forming that picture of your mind of what a kingdom culture looks like. What does the way of life look like? Maybe you're putting this puzzle together at the moment, and as we continue even for the, next, for the rest of this year, speaking on the culture of heaven or the way of life, I trust that the puzzle will continually shape your heart and your mind and that you and I will become more like Jesus. Does that sound good? But the key to understanding, the key to understanding the culture of heaven or a kingdom of God, the key to understanding it is your and my willingness to learn. Do I sit back and after 36 years of, of serving the Lord and, and leading churches, do I just sit back and say, well, I've done this for 36 years. I, I know it well. And, I, and my, my, sometimes I've, there's, there's the, the risk of me not wanting to learn anymore. I might not say it out loud, but in my heart there could be a little bit of pride that says, I've been doing it for 36 years. I know this thing quite well. And we come into a place of complacency. But the way for you and I to understand the kingdom, and remember it's an ever-increasing kingdom, so it's constantly moving and changing. Not that God's laws and His statutes change, but He's constantly moving in you and I to sharpen us and to change us. And as He does that, so I need to have a willingness to learn, an open heart, an open spirit to say, God, whatever you are saying, I want to know, I want to learn, I want to understand. Grow me, and the reason why I'm growing Remember I always used to say that we don't want to be fat Christians like a boiled egg on toothpicks. Got all this knowledge and I do nothing with it. I want to be able to take the knowledge it gives me and I activate it by expressing it in my life. So that when I'm walking down the road and I see somebody is struggling with something, I physically go and help them. I heard somebody recently helped somebody change a tire. I don't know, they stopped on the side of the road, somebody on the N10 saw somebody struggling Stranger stops by and helps with a tire. That's the kind of kingdom thing that we talk about. It doesn't always have to be raising the dead and healing the sick. But we can do it in little ways, like helping an old lady with her shopping trolley to the car and putting it in the car for her. I think sometimes the, the generation, and I'm not talking about an age, I'm possibly talking about the age that we live in right now, can become so self-centered and selfish. But we don't really think about anybody else. I think sometimes... Other people's needs are in our blind spot, and we don't really see it. We're so focused on our own little world and our own problems and our own issues and our own going forward and my own peace and my own joy and I'm worried that we've got blind spots like a horse with blinkers on. We don't get to see everything else. We sang a song this morning where it said that actually what you're giving me, God, is for other people. So instead of me becoming a fat Christian with all this head knowledge and heart knowledge, I'm actually a lean, mean racing machine because I'm like darting all over the place. Lord, what can I give what you have given me? To who can I give it? So we need to have a willingness to learn. 
We need to be open to learning. The kingdom of God is all about change, ever-increasing glory. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8 tells us that. And as we invite a personal, ever-increasing change in our own hearts, so the learning process stays alive in you and I. So even right now, Father, I just want to pray that we would invite a learning process into our lives. Even now, as we stand here and we sit here and we listen to your word, that I pray, Father, that your word would find root in my heart and in our lives and change us. In Jesus' name. So I want to share three points with you today that I hope will change the way you think. Does that sound good? The first process, or the first one that I want to talk about, is the process of salvation. And I just want to run through it, and, and I'm, is, I think everybody is saved, am I right? Is everyone saved? Everyone said yes to Jesus? Yeah, I think everyone has. So the, but we have to understand the process of salvation. When you understand the process of salvation, something will change in your heart and in your mind. So to grasp the idea of salvation, you need to understand that you and I are created as a trichotomy. Can you say that word, say trichotomy? Trichotomy means three in one. That's what we are created as. As human beings, we are body, soul, and spirit. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that there's a distinct difference between the three. The Word of God divides between soul, spirit, bone, and marrow. There's a clear distinction between the three, yet they are separate but joined. Does that make sense? So body, soul, and spirit. And I'm going to use an egg as an example. Three in one. The yolk represents your soul. It gives you to the, the ability to engage your five senses. The body allows you to enjoy the sunset, the smell of rain, maybe meat roasting over the coal. Your body allows that to happen. Maybe it's a hug. It allows you to enjoy a kiss. That's what your body does. And if you look at the, the, the example of an egg, the body is the shell. The shell represents your body. And in the, the physical body, unfortunately, is only here for 70 years plus 10, according to the Bible, which means this body will die one day. I just accept that. It will die. Somebody said the... Um, Death is always sad for those who are left behind because they miss that person. And, uh, and I fully understand that. But death, for you and I as Christians, is actually an upgrade. So we, we do not fear death. We look forward to the resurrected life. Psalm 39 verse 14 is beautiful. It says that you, are for, you formed my inmost parts and you knitted me together. That talks about God, how he knitted you and I, our bodies, together. 1 Corinthians 16, 6 verse 19 to 20 says that, Do you not know that your body is the temple of God? Therefore, honor God with your body. How do we honor God with our body? Number one, by keeping it healthy. We keep it healthy because you've got a job to do. And we can't do the job if we're sick. And you know that job is to extend his kingdom, to advance the kingdom of God. So that is one of the ways we honor our body, by keeping it healthy so that we can accomplish the work God's given us to do. The other one that we need to talk about, that we can honor a God with our bodies in our sexual relationships. We honor God by honoring our marriage and the confines of marriage. It just simply means that we don't have affairs. We don't have one-night stands. It also means that I don't go and watch porn at 12 o'clock at night means I honor God with my body. I honor Him with what He has given me. And the reason you and I have a body is so that we can function on earth. That's why you've got a body, a physical body, so that you and I can function on earth. So in the illustration of an egg, the shell represents the body. The yolk of an egg represents your soul. It is made up of thoughts, your mind, your emotions, and your free will the soul. It is made up of a free will. And the soul can easily lean towards being self-centered, selfish. What's in it for me? 
The soul can easily lean towards being self-centered. I know my rights. The word, the Hebrew word nefesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, nefesh, means soul, mind, or life. And so that is represented in the yolk of an egg. Isn't it amazing that uh, the yolk is in the middle and the soul is in the middle of our body? Do you get the pun there? It's not a yolk, it's a joke. <laughs> so the yolk of an egg represents your soul in the essence of who you are, the way you think, the way you behave, it's your soul. And then the last point is that the white represents your spirit, which gives us our character, our personality. Our spirits were created exclusively, listen to this, friends, exclusively to interact and commune with God. That's why you have a spirit, specifically to interact and commune with God. The spirit in a sense, and I trust you understand this for me, separates believers and unbelievers. Because it is the spirit that is attracted to the Jesus. It is the spirit of man that is attracted to the wonderful goodness of God. And some of us see it and are attracted, and others don't yet know him. But it is that spirit inside of you and I that is attracted to the goodness. It makes us inquisitive about the Father and about salvation. The spirit comes alive when we accept Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, and Colossians 2.13 says that to me, that my spirit comes alive when I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought. Um, I'll get back to it. So the, the next slide I had was of broken eggs. And can you just picture in your mind, we don't have a slide for it right now, but just picture a raw egg, shell broken, smashed open, even the yellow, the yolk is running, a badly broken egg. That's what sin did with Adam. The egg, the, the, the uniqueness of us, body, soul, and spirit was broken. And we've lived for 4,000 years in a broken state until Jesus came back. And my next slide is a whole egg restored to its original design. And it's an illustration of your mind, your soul, and your spirit that through sin and because of Adam's sin, that egg was broken. It was smashed. And you and I cannot put that egg back together again. We cannot separate the yellow from the white. We struggle to do that. There is nothing humanly possible for you and I to reconstruct or put an egg back together again. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And it's the same picture of you and I and the fall of man the egg, the uniqueness of who you and I were created to be was broken. But when Jesus came, he started to speak to your spirit, and your spirit says, Father, I want wholeness. I want that relationship with you that was supposed to have been in the beginning of time. I accept Jesus' death on the cross, and all of a sudden he pulls you back together into a perfectly formed and shaped egg. The yolk in its right place, your spirit alive and active and so attentive to him, and the body, the shell around you, holds it all together. The Bible says that it is his love that encompasses us and holds us all together. So I want you and I to have a look at salvation as a broken egg Nothing I could do to resurrect or to repair that thing. Only through Jesus, his death on the cross, and his resurrection brought me and you back to wholeness and our original design. And in my original design, I'm created to give him honor and glory and to worship him. Maybe, you're, maybe your friends have got some of their yolk and the white of the egg is all mixed and entwined, a bit like a scrambled egg. Only Jesus can unravel all of that and bring you and I back to wholeness and our original design. That is the process of salvation. 
He's taken you and I from complete brokenness and He's pulled us back together. Perfect. Perfect. You are perfect in Jesus. You are perfect in Jesus. Do you get it? Do you honestly understand that you are perfect in Jesus? It's the finished work on the cross. If it wasn't the finished work on the cross, then Jesus would have to die again and again and again. But the Bible tells me that he died once for all. And when I give my heart to him, when he starts to work on my spirit and I start to commune and interact with him, I cry out for wholeness. And I say, Father, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. And all he does is he just brings you and I back into a place of complete wholeness. No slide. Gone. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened because in the next slide were what I would have considered three perfect eggs. eh? They were absolutely beautiful in their shape. There wasn't even a blemish on the skin. And it's a little bit of a picture of what God does to you and I. You know that the Bible tells us that, that you will never, ever be judged for sin again. Do you know that? Seriously? It doesn't mean you can go on sinning. It doesn't mean you have a license to sin. It just says that Jesus paid for it at the cross. He dealt with our sin. You'll never be judged for your sin again. What you will be judged for is what have you done with what God has given you. In other words, he's given you salvation. He's given every one of us a mandate to go and tell the world about him. Have we done it? He's given you gifts. If, you're, if you've got a gift of prophecy, are you using that gift? That's where we, you and I will be judged one day, where he says to me, but I gave you a gift of administration. I've given you a gift of preaching. I've given you a gift of prophecy. I've given you a gift to heal people. Those are the things that we'll be judged for one day, not for sin. But again, let me make sure that you understand, it does not give us a license to sin. If I abuse His grace, and I expect that salvation and the wholeness that He's given me is now a license to go and do whatever I want to, I've misunderstood it, and I'm literally crucifying Jesus again and again and again. So the good news... The good news of salvation is that you can see yourself and myself as a broken egg. And when I said yes to Jesus, he brought me back to perfection and absolute wholeness. You know that the the Bible says that when the Father looks at you and I, he looks at us through Jesus. He does not see me in a sinful, broken state anymore. He sees me whole. It is a beautiful gift of righteousness that you and I have been given. And we sometimes abuse it because we might not understand it correctly. But I'm trusting the illustration of an egg really brings back to you the process of salvation. Ezekiel 37. It's a beautiful picture of of Ezekiel standing before the Lord and God says to him, Ezekiel, do you think these dry bones in this valley can live? And the Bible talks about this valley filled with just dry bones. And Ezekiel kind of cops out of this whole question when God says to him, do you think these bones can live? He goes, uh, hey Lord, only you know. It's quite a bit of a, an amazing answer if you think about it. So God says to Ezekiel, do you think these dry bones can live? And the same question is put to you and I today. Do you think your illness can be, re- can be released? Do you think that the thing that you're struggling with, the decisions that you need to be made, do you think those things can live? And God is saying to you, if you believe it, then prophesy. What happened with Ezekiel? God said to him, Do you believe these dry bones can live? Ezekiel said, Father, only you know. And then God said to him, Now now you prophesy over the dry bones. So God did not just go and say, All right, Ezekiel, I'll do it for you. He said, No, no, Ezekiel, you prophesy, speak life into these dry bones. So when you and I are faced with a situation, maybe there's some some friction in our marriage, maybe there's a problem in your business, maybe there's a a, a child or somebody in your family that doesn't know the Lord, hasn't been exposed to the Holy Spirit yet, what do you and I do? We start to prophesy over that life. We start to prophesy over that situation. And we start to speak the goodness of God. We start to speak the wholeness of God over that situation. That is how we do what Ezekiel did in chapter 37 when we start to prophesy 
over situations and circumstances that we're facing. If you're experiencing something that is dragging on for a year or two and you just don't seem to be able to get any, any uh, end to the problem or to the issue that you're facing, start to prophesy over it. Start to prophesy over it. I spoke to you guys once before, and I don't know if you can remember. Back in Durban, there was a, a, a lady, a widow with two kids who, who was not able to pay the bond on her home. And so she put, put her house on the market. She needed to sell it, settle the bank because they were on her back, as banks can do. That's the thing about debt, eh? The Bible says it's like a noose around your neck and that we are indebted to that debtor until we, until that credit until we actually pay him in full. So here's this woman in Durban struggling to pay her, her mortgage or her bond, and she's, she's praying, and she's saying, Father, please help me sell my house. God, please help me sell my house. God, I ask you to sell my house for me. God, I ask you, please send a buyer around. Let them come and knock on the door and buy my house for me. And she had the wrong idea of asking. And she kept saying, God, I need to sell my house, please. And a bit of a desperation, she just kept saying, God, please sell my house for me. Please help me sell my house. Please send a buyer along. And I remember her coming to Jeannie and I, and we said to her, maybe you've got to change the way you think. And I said to her, how many other houses in your street are, are, are also for sale? And she said, yeah, there's about six or seven other soundboards up. I said, okay, what I want to ask you now to do is don't ask God to help you sell your house anymore. Ask God to sell the other houses in your street. And she was like gobsmacked, like, what do you mean? So I said, no, no, go and speak and ask God to sell those houses. You know, a week later, her house was sold. I'm just simply trying to give you an illustration here. When we take our focus off of the problem and we start to consider other people around us, their brokenness and their state of brokenness, we autom automatically start seeing our healing, even though we didn't even understand we might have needed it. Is that making sense? So guys, the idea is to focus on others and not on ourselves. And that brings me to the next point in my, in my preach this morning, is that we need to be understanding that the kingdom is about other people, about doing what is best for others and not just myself. I am so thankful Jesus lived that out to the full. In Matthew 26, verse 36 to 46, the Bible tells me that Jesus was in the garden praying before he got arrested. And Jesus in his prayer was real, and honest, that even Jesus said, this, is, this cup is too much for me to bear. The Bible goes on to say that his soul is crushed, and he's crushed with grief. Jesus was real and honest about his feelings. And then he goes on to say, but not what I want. What do you want, Lord? And Jesus focused on other people, not on his own needs, and the second point for you and I to understand the kingdom of God is that it's actually about other people. It's not all about you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I'm deflating your balloon right now. It's actually not about you. You're already saved. Tick. I'm going to heaven. Tick. I've got Holy Spirit in me. Tick. Done. Now tell others about it. So the gospel is not just about you and you having a cushy laugh. The gospel is not about you so that it's plain sailing from now on because we still live in a fallen world. The gospel is you and I have been brought into wholeness so that we can tell others about Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the mandate. That's why I've got this physical body so that I can tell other people about Jesus. I can tell people about his goodness and his love and his generosity. Put others first. Best example, Matthew 26, 36 to 46. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, it also says that we begin to recognize the lifestyle of heaven or the way of life when we identify what is good for us and beneficial. As we process kingdom life that Jesus came to demonstrate, we begin to evaluate everything through the lens of, is it good for me? Will I and others benefit from this decision I make? All of a sudden, the focus comes off of you and I, remember what I said about our soul? It has the tendency to be self-centered, tendency to be a bit selfish. But in the kingdom of God, when we understand what the way of life is like, the way of life is actually all about everyone else. And so when I understand the word of God, I start to say, this decision I'm about to make in business, is it good for my employees as well? This decision I'm about to make in life, is it good for my family as well? 
This decision I'm about to make in life, is it good for those around me? Follow him. Will it be beneficial to other people? Will they see Jesus in me with this decision I'm about to make? So every time you are faced with a decision, my friends, the, 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 leading, um, the leading command or understanding in your heart or the leading question in your heart, will it, is it good for me and will it benefit others? I'm not talking about should I buy a new car. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about life. A decision to move, physically move, move houses somewhere. Is it beneficial for my family or is it just because I'm scared of where I am at the moment? You know what I mean? So when we start looking at life issues, we start to say, is it good for me and is it beneficial to others around me? As ambassadors of heaven, you and I are called to replicate, repeat, and duplicate actions and behavior of heaven. Put others first. Put others first. The third aspect of the kingdom culture is that my identity is clear. When my identity is clear, I can function at a different place and a different level. My identity is found in right standing with the Father. In other words, when he looks at me, he sees me as a complete, whole egg back to its original design. That's how he sees me. So my identity is rooted in my wholeness, not in my broken state. So my identity is not in my brokenness. My dead identity is in my right standing with the Father. When the Spirit identifies with the finished work on the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit, my identity is established and rooted in His righteousness. It's not because of my good works. It's not because of my performance. It's not because of my busyness. I realize that it's all a gift from God. I do not have to work to receive His kindness. I don't have to work to receive His goodness. I don't have to work to receive His forgiveness. All I had to say was, yes, Jesus. When my identity is secure and I am totally convinced and I wish the slides were working, when your identity is secure, you can, believe, you can begin to live with this kind of security in your heart. Number one is Ephesians 1.4, I am chosen. That's security. It talks about my identity. Ephesians 1 verse 3, I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. Secure in my identity. Ephesians 4, we are strong in unity. Secure in our identity as a fellowship of believers. Ephesians 2 and 3, secure in the thing that I love and I forgive. I, I know I joke with you before a preach and I ask, often ask you to men tell other men that you love each other. But I am secure in the fact that Jesus loved me, gave himself for me, and I can now take that love that he has given me and I can show it to other people. I'm secure in loving and in forgiving others. And that's a preach on its own, forgiveness. But Ephesians 5 and 6 says that I am secure in my, in my relationship with God and my identity that my household reflects whom I serve. Does your household reflect Jesus? And Ephesians 2 verse 7, it says that we know the incomparable great power of God. I am secure in the power of God. It is incomparable. I cannot compare the power of God to anything else, but it is my security. And the other point of my security is that I've got the full armor of God on me to protect me from the enemies. And remember, the enemy wants to see you broken. So he's going to attack that egg of yours. And he's going to try again and again and again. Now, the beautiful part is that once I've given my heart to the Lord, it is once and for all. And nothing the enemy can do can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can change my standing with him. And so I'm secure in my salvation. So friends, finishing off, to know the kingdom, to know the way of life or the culture of heaven, understand the process of salvation, do what is best for others, it's not just about you, and be secure in your identity. That sound good? Why don't you stand with me and we're going to pray.